The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome to Yaron Brook Show on this, uh, what is it? It's still Tuesday. I've been out of it a little bit today. Still Tuesday, and um, yeah, I hope you're having a great, uh, great week so far. All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit of politics uh, and uh, philosophy and uh, ethics and, and so on. Uh, and I've got a, a little political poll going. So, um, uh, you know, if you could vote in the Republican Party primary, party primary tomorrow, whom would you vote for? Uh, so I've only got four candidates up there because uh, the polling app, whatever, uh, it limits me to four choices. So I, I can't have more than four. I would have added, uh, I would have added Pence and Christie if I could. Um, although I, I have a feeling Pence wouldn't have gotten a lot of support in this, in this group, but Christie might have. Uh, so uh, that's too bad. But I think this is a, this will give us a good reflection of what's going on. Um, I, I, I want to encourage you. Um, I want to just say that this is anonymous, so I won't know what you voted. Uh, I won't, uh, you know, I, I have no, um, it doesn't give me the names. It just, it's anonymous. So uh, those of you secretly actually desire to vote for Trump, please vote for Trump if that's what you secretly desire to do so. Um, <laughs> so far, nobody's voting for Trump, uh, and, and this is why, uh, this is why I have uh, so few subscribers, I think, is because I, I have a pre-selected group of people that does not represent the world out there at all. <laughs> now, that I, you know, I view that as a compliment to you guys, but you don't represent the world at all. I mean, even DeSantis is not coming in second. Haley gets 75 percent of the vote. Who are you kidding? <laughs> uh, who are you kidding? It's... Um, yeah, it's it it is uh, it, it is not uh, reflective of anything out there in actual reality. Uh, but uh, but yeah, just curious to see how you vote. And and of course, you know my preference generally is Nikki Haley. But I've been saying that for years now. Um, actually, going back to twenty sixteen, I think I said it. Uh, when she wasn't even running. But uh, please don't vote what you think I would vote. Oh, we got a Trump voter. We got a Trump voter. Uh, that's good. That's good. So at least we have one Trump voter. So I'm, I'm feeling a little better about the fact that uh, my audience is, uh, is a little sympathetic. I noticed also that somebody just stopped watching live. So maybe they voted and ran. <laughs> I don't know. All right. As we get more views uh, during the evening, maybe uh, this will uh, change a little bit. And also do this. I'll do this every few weeks so that we can see if there are any uh, significant changes as more information comes in. Uh, as, as we see, we got two Trump voters. All right. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know if somebody's just messing with me or, uh, or we really have it. All right. So... <laughs> Um, actually, you know, I, I, if there were a lot of uh, if there were a lot of people voting for Trump, then then uh, you know that would uh, explain a lot of things about the world. As it is, uh, those true Trump voters bewilders me completely. Completely, it's not like the poll here is Trump Biden, right? Then I get it, but this is Trump DeSantis Vivek Kaley. I mean, really, really. Um, James can't vote. He just can't do it. He just can't do it. All right. That's okay. That's okay. Call Sagan. I don't know if I'd want Carl Sagan as president. He was good at what he did. He was good as a communicator regarding uh, the passion of science. But as a president, uh, yeah, no, I don't think so. All right. Uh, too, too mellow and, and too leftist and too... Yeah, I mean, I liked him as a presenter, as a popularizer of science. I loved him in that TV show that he did. He was fantastic there. All right, so today I want to talk about um, 
politics and evasion, and um, I'd say our politics of evasion, because one of the things that I think is so um, characteristic of the political world in which we live right now is uh, is the amount, the depth, the extent of the evasion going on. Uh, I don't. I think this is what makes the, this particular election cycle even worse than 2016 and 2020. This particular election cycle. Uh, <laughs> Oh, not for president. I thought, Jennifer, you were voting for Carl Sagan for president. <laughs> All right, not for president. That's good to know. Uh, Liam's quote. Okay, I, I don't see Liam's quote. I missed it. All right. Oh, it must be, must be in the question. Um, all right. So uh, this election cycle seems to be just dominated by evasion on all sides and dominated by evasion on all topics on all issues it's not even that it's relegated to i don't know they don't get economics or they don't understand history or they don't understand this or that but they really have no concept period of anything they're evading on a scale uh, you know, I have uh, I have never seen I have never seen. I'm not sure you really want Elon Musk as president. He's probably better suited for where he is right now. Wonder Freeman said you would get billions of votes. No, that's Trump. Trump gets billions of votes, humongous votes, and the votes from the best people, the 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 the, the coolest, best. Fantastic, wonderful, amazing, billions and billions of people. That that's Trump. That's not that's not Elon Musk. So think about just the, 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 the candidates. I mean, particularly and particularly there are really only two candidates right now. I mean, we can we can play around with Haley and Vivek and, and DeSantis, but they're not in the race. Right? They're not in the race. Basically, the two candidates, and that is um, that is Trump and uh, and Biden, and th and that's because of the three people voting for Trump. They've got a choice within the Republican Party, but they still want Trump. So that's who we have. So let's start with with Biden. I mean, Biden's old. He's old not just in number of years, he's just old. He's old in cognitive function. He's old in, in, in physical ability. He can't keep track. Now, granted, Biden was never the sharpest guy ever. I mean, he, he, his gaffes, his ridiculous, silly statements. I mean, he, he, a, a legendary. But now he's just old. Right now, now he just can't follow along. Now he just rambles and babbles and doesn't know who he is half the time. And he, he's, he's way too old to be president. He's way too old to be in any executive function. Indeed, if he was on a board of directors, they would ask him to leave. A proper board of directors, not one that uh, is he's there for influence. But if he was on a board or if he was a CEO, he, he'd be asked to leave. It, it's just... Impossible for somebody with that cognitive ability at this point in his life to, to act and to function as an executive, and not just any executive, but as the CEO, as, as, as the president of the, the, the United States, a country of 350 million people, the strongest military force in human history, and an arsenal of nuclear weapons, Unbelievable decisions have to be made on, on any given day that have consequences uh, globally and, and on, every, on the life of every American in the country. And yet, and, and Democrats, when they are polled, in polls, all say he's too old. Nobody cares. I mean, it's just, everybody's just going through the motions as if this is it. There's no options. There's no choices. 
uh, there's, uh, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to change anything. We're just going to plow ahead with a old president who can't think, who can't communicate, and who nobody wants, right? Nobody wants. He is unliked. His uh, favorability ratings are the same as Trump's, which is bad. Really, really, really bad. And yet, again, just plow ahead, keep going, just ignore, evade the reality of what you're facing. Too difficult. Why deal with it? I mean, Democrats need a CEO to come in and say, you're fired. Or you'll keep going. We'll keep you the first term. But we're going to get somebody younger with more energy and more just mental capacity. Not Kamala, Kamala, but somebody. It, it wouldn't be that hard. Now, if you add to that, that he is facing real challenges. <laughs> you know, the, the, the Biden, Hunter Biden, President Biden, Justice Department, IRS, uh, corruption, phone calls, Ukraine, China, all of that. It, it's real. It's there. It's who knows how bad it is. It wouldn't be surprising if it was really bad, but it doesn't matter. It, and it's not going to get better. It's not like tomorrow they're going to be revelations say, oh, yeah, yep. Joe, Joe Biden was not involved. Hunter, bad apple. But Joe, you know, Biden, vice president, never involved, didn't do anything. He's completely kosher. Like, there's no way that evidence is coming out because it doesn't exist. I mean, it might be worse, it might be better, but the idea that he is corrupt is going to be with us. It's going to be with the Democrats. It's going to be with the campaign. And one of the, one of the uh, you know, uh, uh, levers the Democrats have over Trump is with a party of sanity, we're, 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 you know, we're not corrupt. We're, I don't know, nice people. We're, we're normal. We're not vulgar, ridiculous, authoritarian, corrupt idiots. But Biden is. <laughs> so it, it becomes very difficult for them to, to have the one, one of their big advantages they have over Trump. One of the reasons there's a good chance that even Biden could be Trump is Trump's negative ratings. Biden has them. And, and Trump's, the perception of Trump as being corrupt and being, uh, you know, uh, just a, a sleazy human being. Well, here we get Biden, who sleazy human being. And there's no adults in the Democratic Party to say, all right, let's have a primary or let's just go into a smoke-filled room and decide who replaces him. It, it, you know, it would probably be the governor of California who has uh, the most stature among Democrats right now. But who knows who it would be? It's certainly not going to be uh, RFK and it's certainly not going to be Williamson. It, it's it's going to be one of the governors. But it's, I'm not, it's not clear to me at all that it's going to get to that because they'd rather bury the head in the sand. They'd rather pretend that it's not going on, rather pretend that all these problems don't exist, that they don't, they're not there, they don't exist, than actually face them and deal with them. And that's evasion. Evasion is refusing to look, refusing to acknowledge reality, refusing to accept reality, ignoring it, pretending it doesn't exist. 
But knowing it's there, because they all know it's there. They all know he's lost it. I mean, that's one among the many evasions, but it's so obvious and it's right at the top that is going on. We'll get to other evasions that, that, that are permeate, right? And then you've got the Republican Party, which has, uh, in, a dramatic, in a huge lead, huge, massive lead, uh, Donald Trump leading the Republicans in all the polls. He doesn't do particularly well against Biden in the polls, but he does very, very well against other Republicans in the polls. Indeed, of the candidates that I've listed, Trump, DeSantis, Vivek, and Haley, both DeSantis and Haley do better than Trump, and Haley does a lot better than Trump and quite a bit better than DeSantis. So if what you really care about is beating Biden, Republicans are picking a candidate who lost to Biden. The picking candidate who lost the Senate twice, arguably, and who lost the House once. And so they all say it's all about winning. We voted for Trump because we want to win, but Trump's a loser. He won one election, and he's lost every one since. So it, it's bizarre. And then all these candidates are running as if Trump's not even there. They won't say a word against him, with the exception of Chris Christie. It's as if they're running against Vivek or they're running against DeSantis. So, you know, in, in the debate, they were all attacking Vivek. But nobody's running against Vivek. It doesn't matter what Vivek says or does or believes or presents himself as. It makes zero difference. The only person that you have to beat in order to be the Republican nominee for president, the only person you have to beat, is Donald Trump. But they won't even mention his name. And they certainly won't say any negative about him. All of them on stage know the real meaning of January 6th and how awful and horrific and horrible it was. Every single one of them knows that. And yet, they won't admit it. They won't say it. They will say exactly the opposite. They will downplay it. Everybody knows up there on the stage that Trump is guilt is, is at least it's reasonable to prosecute him for any one of the things that he's being prosecuted for. And none of them will say it. None of them. They're on the contrary, it's a witch hunt. They ignore it completely. And indeed, that's not just true of the people on stage. It's true of the Republican electorate. I guess with the exception of people who listen, uh, you know, uh, people who listen to Iran Brooks show. They don't care that Donald Trump is super unpopular among the left, uh, American electorate. They don't care he's corrupt. They don't care he lies constantly. They don't care that his policies, or many of his policies, failed. They don't care about, I, I, they don't care about anything. They're just gonna vote for Trump. Reality doesn't matter. Facts don't matter. They don't care that Trump is authoritarian. Maybe they think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. They don't care it's vulgar. And it's not about Trump's ideas, because the extent that he has any ideas, and he doesn't really, but the extent that he has or projects ideas, DeSantis and Vivek are one-upping him. They're matching him idea for idea. They're taking up all of his ideas. And indeed, they're making them their own. And, and doing so in a more convincing way, I could argue.
So it's not about ideas. It's not that they love Trump's ideas. So they're willing to evade Trump's failure during COVID. The fact that he was indeed one of the initial primary cheerleaders for lockdowns. They're willing to evade his cheerleading for vaccines. Now, that's the one good thing he did in his whole, you know, one of the few things he good that he did during his whole presidency. They're just willing to evade the reality of who he is and the difficulty for him to win his, and, and the fact that if he wins, the Republican Party is in shambles. And, but it's not just the voters. It's the people running against him, which is bizarre. I mean, he wasn't there on stage to defend himself. Okay. Maybe it wouldn't have been a bad idea to go after him. But no, Trump is not the competition, somehow. And it's, you know, not just that. It's the evasion pretty much of everything. The, the, the actual state of America, of American culture, of the American economy, they either make it appear too dark, too bad, too uh, distraught. They either lie constantly about the nature of what's going on. But that's the kind of lying that is done in politics all the time. But there is a, there's a kind of, and, and, and I think this is, this is Trump's pragmatism and Trump's presidency and Trump's and populism. What was that great quote about populism? You know, uh, uh, the difference between a populist and just a general politician who lies is that when an ordinary politician lies, then he lies and, and he's, trying to, he's trying to convince people that the lie is true and, and everybody knows that he's lying. Anybody knows there's a truth out there. And the difference is when the populist lies, nobody cares about the truth. The truth doesn't matter. The truth is irrelevant. And I think what all the politicians have learned now is the truth is irrelevant. You tell a story, you make something up. If it convinces people, great, then it worked, and then it's true. And if it didn't convince people, then it's bad, and you should walk away from it, and that's it. And you know, just try a different lie, try a different tact, try a different angle. You know, take this migrant crisis, right? There's a migrant crisis. God, I mean, it's, it's all these migrants in New York and they're in these other cities and the cities can't cope. They don't have the budget. They're paying through the roof. They have to house them. They have to feed them. They have to all this stuff, and, and nobody can afford it, and yet more and more migrants are coming in, and there's a migrant crisis. Now, everybody knows what the solution to the crisis is. I mean, certainly Mayor Adams has expressed what the solution to the crisis is. But everybody pretends, because it's convenient for them to pretend so, that there is no solution, that the solution is to build a wall, or the solution is more money, or the solution is you know, more welfare, more redistribution, or building a wall. That's the left and the right solution. And I give uh, the mayor of New York credit for the fact that he actually gets it. What's the solution to the migrant crisis? There's one simple solution that could be implemented tomorrow. And basically the crisis goes away. Allow them to work. Allow them to work. You know, right now, the crisis is caused by the fact that they're not allowed to work. So they can't make a living. So they become 
dependent on welfare. And the welfare rules are limited. Welfare rules are limited. And that's the crisis. The crisis is not a crisis of migrants coming in. It's a crisis of the welfare state not being able to pay for those migrants, not being able to subsidize those migrants. But the solution is obvious. It's always obvious. It's, it's you know, people pay their way in life. And if they don't, somebody else has to pay. And it's kind of obvious that the people running out of money right now are not the migrants. They don't have any. It's the city, and why is the city running out of money? The city's running out of money for one simple, plain reason. That they have to fund it all. The solutions to all these challenges that we face are simple. They're easy. Right? But that requires facing reality, evaluating your choices, having clear standards by which to make those choices, and then acting on them, executing on them. But that's exactly what they can't do. So, um, yeah, I mean, so uh, entire political map, entire political process, entire uh, uh, the stories we tell ourselves, they're all just based on not being willing to face the facts, not being able to, not being willing to face reality, not being, not being willing to deal with reality as it is. Um, Phil Graham the uh, former senator from Texas. Uh, yeah, I mean, I miss Phil Graham. God, Phil Graham was, uh, was a really good senator. I mean, I, I, you only appreciate somebody like Phil Graham after he's no longer there, and uh, you notice the idiots who, who, actually, uh, who actually replace him, right? Who actually replace him. And, and you start missing people like that. Phil Graham is a professor of economics. He has been the president of a and uh, University. Um, and uh, Phil used to be a senator from Texas, a very conservative senator, and, but was really good in economics. He's an economist, after all. And he understands economics. He's written an excellent book out there about inequality. I, I highly recommend it, uh, about how Inequality in the United States has gone down, not up, uh, over the last uh, 40 years. Uh, everything, everything you've been told about the state of the economics over the last 40 years is wrong. And, uh, and uh, Phil uh, has, has a whole book presenting the evidence for that. Anyway, he has an excellent op-ed in uh, yesterday's um, yesterday Wall Street Journal. It's actually co-authored by, um, uh, with uh, Don Boudreau. I don't know if you know Don Boudreau, but Don Boudreau is a libertarian economist from uh, George Mason University. And uh, the title of the op-ed is Trump's, war, Trump's trade war was a loser, another area in which Trump was a loser. Tariffs destroyed jobs in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, and made all Americans worse off. And they go through the numbers. They go through the facts of how destructive the tariffs were, how many jobs they destroyed, how many businesses, American businesses, they hurt, how they raised prices on Americans. And of course, we all know the tariffs are paid or just the tax on Americans. And the Wall Street Journal, I mean, here are two really good economist. We just show this. And the funny thing about it is, why would you need to show it? And this is, again, the evasion. 
everybody knows, everybody knows, at least anybody, anybody economics knows, the tariffs don't work. The tariffs are destructive. The tariffs are harmful. The tariffs make you poorer, not richer, poorer. As I've said often, Paul Krugman got his Nobel Prize for an essay on the idea that free trade is better. The trade restrictions, trade tariffs are bad. It doesn't matter. And it's kind of obvious, and I've gone through it a million times, and I'm sure we'll go over it again because tariffs are here to stay, and if anything, they're going to increase. Nobody cares. Nobody's interested in the actual science. Nobody's interested in the actual impact. Nobody interested in, everybody claims to be make America great again and America first. Nobody's interested if Donald Trump actually made America great again or actually placed America first. He didn't. They don't care. Complete evasion. Complete evasion. We have inflation. Everybody knows where inflation comes from. And yet again, nobody wants to blame government spending for it. Nobody wants to blame the stimulus for it because the consequences, they come up with all kinds of excuses, supply chain issues, and you know, they talk about excess demand and, ex and supply cha uh, challenges. Where does excess demand come from? Checks handed to people? Are we going to blame Biden? Are we going to blame Trump? No. No. We'll give them credit for what we think is the good stuff. We don't blame them for the bad stuff. So Democrats evade Biden's uh, horrible economics. I mean, you've got economists who should know all the downfalls, the pitfalls, the problems, the challenges, the, and how rare it is, for example, for government industrial planning to work. And yet, because Biden's doing it, they're evading it, they're ignoring it, they're pretending it doesn't exist, never happened. Right? Never happened. I, but you can go on and on. I mean, remember when Trump, what he said about trade deficits? Trade deficits are, are, are signs of, quote, hemorrhaging of America's lifeblood. Really? Who comes up with these lines? And yet, uh, exact opposite, trade deficits suggest that you're rich and people want to hold your currency and people want to invest in your country. Uh, but again, it's exact opposite of reality and nobody cares. Nobody's interested. We all understand that appeasing evil is never good. Everybody now, all the, everybody on the right now is critical of the deal that Biden is cutting with the Iranians. How dare he? Selling America's futures out, negotiating with evil. You should never negotiate with evil. Releasing Americans, cutting deals with the bad guys. And they're right. But when their guy did it, they evaded it completely. They ignored it completely. It didn't exist. When Trump signed a peace treaty with the Taliban, it didn't exist. It didn't happen. Or then it was the right thing to do because, hey, we need to get out of Afghanistan and, and, and better sign a deal than stay there. So it's okay to negotiate with evil and bad guys when it's your guy negotiating, when it achieves the goals that you somehow want to achieve. And one of the most fantastical things, and I, I have to say, there are a few things that Trump did that I, it didn't surprise me they did them, but people's re reaction to it shocked me, just blew me away. The, the, the response of people who used to be pro-free trade, were adamantly pro-free trade, hated tariffs, hated trade restrictions, how they came around to loving trade restrictions when Trump did them blew me away. How quickly the whole, all the theory they knew, everything they knew about trade disappeared when Trump did it. And the same thing happened about this negotiating with evil. All these people who had a clear understanding of in foreign policy, you just don't negotiate with, with, with 
bad guys. You don't negotiate. It, it just shows weakness. And then when he went and groveled before the brutal dictator of North Korea, suddenly it was okay. No, no, you got to be realistic. And he was threatening us after all. I mean, what do you want? Uh, you want nukes in California? I mean, some of you probably do, but you want nukes in California? Because that's what, that's what would have happened if not for Donald Trump's groveling, book, you know, with the you know, love letters to the dictator, the brutal dictator of North Korea. And suddenly everybody was for it. I, I still, I, you know, I did a, a video on this and, and, and I get the comment section is full of, well, what do you, what do you want? What was he supposed to do? That's not groveling. That's, that's diplomacy. That's courageousness. That's, yep, 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 yep. We know exactly what would have happened if Biden had done it and what the same people's attitude would have been. This is, yeah, and, and we've got Scott here will defend Trump's craziness rationalize it away it it's just it's evasion it's it's evasion on scale it's abandonment of all principles 4d chess you remember 4d chess for you you have to remind yourself of 4d chess because it's coming back it's all 4d chess no it's not never was no evidence of it, zero, all just mindless evasion everywhere. And look, this isn't surprising. This is what tribalism does. This is how tribalism works. This is how hate-driven tribalism works. And this is not about disagreement, because this is not, these are not issues in dispute. Certainly not issues in dispute among people that should be issues of dispute among people who listen to my show, who know anything about RAND or objectivism. But these are not difficult issues. These are not complex issues. Show the issues in economics, a little complex. I get it why many simple people don't get tariffs. They think trade deficits are bad. I, I get that. They even think that working people in America are worse off today than they were 40 years ago. I get why ordinary people think that. Because economics is hard, and the economic, the, 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 the politicians and the economists keep telling them that. They keep telling them that as if it's true. But the reality is, the reality is, that anybody who knows anything about economics, even a little bit, anybody can look at the data and look at a graph, anybody who reads a little bit wider than just his little tribe, and, and on economic issues, the left and the right agree, so it's not even a little tribe. They all agree on tariffs. They all agree on trade restrictions. They all agree that the conditions of the working class have deteriorated over the last 40 years. But anybody who has any kind of education or knows anything has to evade not to know that these are not true. The data is just too unequivocal. So yes, there are a lot of people who disagree with me who I don't say are evaders. There are a lot of people who think different things and I don't think are evading. But there's a lot of evasion going on in the world, a lot of evasion going on in the world. And there's a lot of evasion going on in our politics, more than I've ever seen it. More than I've ever seen it. And it's real, and it's destructive, because all evasion is destructive. Indeed, it's suicidal, because our means of survival is our mind. We negate our mind, when we put our mind on neutral, when we allow ourselves to just accept, to just go with the flow, when we just conform to the tribe, when we conform to the leader, when we conform to just being against the left or just being against the right, whatever it happens to be, we lose objectivity, we lose rationality, and we lose our means of survival. We lose our ability to live well. 
and we make bad decisions. And God, that is where we are today in America because bad decisions are being made left and right. And I mean left and right. And, um, you know, th th there's nobody really out there. And I think, I think who's actually willing to look at the American people and tell them the truth. And I think if somebody did that, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm just a romantic, but if somebody did that, maybe they'd score some points. Maybe it would actually resonate. If somebody just looked at the American people and told them what it really is, what it's really like, what it really refers to. What, how the world functions, how the world works, what is right and what is wrong. It would be refreshing if somebody, you know, you got to, I mean, Ross Perot was a bit of a kind of a, a joke, right? But when he went on television, he said, look, America, here's some real problems. And he has flip charts and he had his graphs and he told it like it is. And he got 15% of the vote. And I think he got it for that reason, because he was willing to face up to the issues. And notice that the candidates at the debate did not get any questions about, and, and the same thing will happen with the Democrats, it's not just Republicans, no questions about Medicare, no questions about Social Security, no questions about paying back the debt, about deficits and surpluses, no real questions about how, how to get the economy growing at 4% a year. No. I mean, uh, all of those crucial, important issues, complete evasion, complete ignoring, not mentioning at all. Apollo Zeus says Ross Perot is 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> okay, he didn't look 6'6 six, six on TV. <laughs> One of Freeman says, how many votes would Ronald Reagan get in today's environment? I don't know. I don't know. I, I think he'd get some. I, I'm not quite ready to give up completely on the idea that he'd get some. But, but would he even get a, a, a hearing? All, all the media, all the political parties, all the activists within the political parties want to hear is how terrible things are and how the other tribe is evil and wrong and it's all their fault. Actually, to talk about America, to talk about what America stands for, to talk about the role of government, to talk about what should and could be done. Yeah. How to make America great again, literally. It doesn't seem like there's any interest in hearing any of that. All right, that was depressing. And it's only, you know, it's only going to get worse. I mean, Imagine if, and, and this is, imagine it, but this is the reality that we're going to face soon enough. And that is, imagine that Joe Biden and Donald Trump are indeed the candidates. What, are, what is anybody going to do? And I'm not talking about how you will vote, because that's irrelevant. But, but what's the country going to do? What's the country going to feel like? What's it going to be like to live in a country where this is the best that could be done? Where everybody knows these guys should not be candidates for president. Everybody knows there are better people out there. Everybody knows that. And yet, this is it. This is it. This is the best we can do. What kind of country is that? What kind of country does that represent? And how can it be that even among my listeners, 
Seven percent. Well, seven percent. So, would vote for Trump among these candidates, not again against Biden. Among these candidates. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I'm glad we have some. And, and it's surprising because why they would listen to my triads against uh, Trump. But it's so crushingly disappointing that anybody, when faced with clearly superior candidates by every dimension, including winning and doing stuff in office and changing the world even a little bit, would still prefer Trump. I don't get it. I'm missing, missing something. All right. Um, you know, and, and, and the country's, and things are only going to get worse, right? I mean, the economy's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. We're facing the stagnation. We could head into multiple crises every few years. Uh, government spending is not going to go away. The war in Ukraine is not going to go away. Russia's going to be there. No matter how you spin this, it's unlikely it ends well. Even if Ukraine kicks the Russians out, Russians are not going to just fold up and say, okay, sorry. They're going to keep tensions, if not there, somewhere else. But Trump won't deal with your biggest threat. Trump is a coward and a wimp. What did he do in his four years? Nothing. And this is the evasion, right? This is the evasion. Trump will do something. But he, he was there. He was president. He did nothing. The left got stronger under Trump, not weaker, and won and beat him. So what did he do? Nothing. So, I mean, if, if you care about defeating the left, if that's your primary focus, why wouldn't you go with DeSantis? who at least has a track record of success, who at least is a winner, not a loser. Trump's a loser and everything he's done. And his policies were losers and his policies did not dent the left. He didn't even call out the military when, 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 uh, when the riots were happening. They didn't cheat to win. You're such a sore loser, Ken. It's stunning. I mean, they talk about evasion. We've talked about evasion all evening. It, it, the evasion of the people who still think Trump won the election it is just, it's, it's mind boggling, but it's, it's, it's this tribalism. The, the evasion of the people who think that the, the Trump did anything to counter the left. He did nothing, zero, zilch, except moan and complain. He did a few good things and a lot of bad things. Trump could deal with Iran as a threat, did he? Four years, what did he do with Iran? Nothing. So every, every evidence suggests that the Israelis were willing to take out Iran and he, like every other president of the United States, stopped them. What did he do? He killed Soleimani, and then what? Nothing. Good for killing Soleimani, but if that's all you're gonna do, why even bother? Why kill one guy? What's the point? On every issue that you claim Trump did something, he didn't. He literally did not. Nothing of substance, nothing of significance. Biden is tough on China than Trump was. Trump wasn't particularly tough on Iran. Trump was weak on Russia and weak on North Korea. Why would the Iranians think he'd be tough on them? Nothing. Trump was good on taxes. Every Republican is good on taxes. Every Republican ever, except George Bush Sr., has decreased taxes, has reduced taxes. So he was good on taxes. Awful on tariffs, which is a tax, by the way. Oh, he was obstructed by rhinos. Always excuses. Always excuses. But even if he was obstructed by rhinos, did he get, by the way, his biggest failure, maybe, in the early part of his administration, at least, did he get rid of Obamacare? A promise, campaign promise. No, couldn't even get, couldn't even get the Republicans to do that. 
I mean, he was a weak president, a, a dramatically weak president. So why not vote for somebody like DeSantis, who's shown that he can rally Republicans around his cause, who's shown that he can get stuff done? I'm not supporting DeSantis, but I'm saying if you want Trump stuff, why not actually vote for somebody competent who could probably get it done? Why vote for somebody who showed he couldn't? Oh, yeah, it was McCain. Oh, blame everything on McCain. How many times did Trump go to Capitol Hill to lobby his senators to repeal Obamacare? Did uh, Trump propose an alternative to Obamacare, something that could solve McCain's problems with just doing away with it without having an alternative? Did he offer anything? Did he propose anything? Did he talk about greater privatization? No, indeed, Donald Trump praised the Australian system and other systems that were basically socialized medicine. He's a pro-socialized medicine guy. Obamacare wasn't, didn't go far enough for him in socializing health care in the United States. I mean, you guys never, the problem is you guys didn't actually listen to what he said, didn't follow what he actually did, and are just enamored with the aura, with the man, with the image, with the tribe, and he's your leader. Follow the leader. You got to brain people. Think for yourself. Look at the world. Evaluate, examine, judge. And I get it. I get it. You vote for Trump over Biden. I get it. 2020, you voted for Trump. But now you've got other candidates. You can vote in a primary. And some of you are still voting for Trump. He's not as bad as I make him out to be. He's much worse, Scott. And, and again, it's, it's you're ignoring and evading and pretending and for the chessing that makes him appear better than what I'm saying he is. But I, I haven't yet found the combination of words to express how bad I think he really is. All right, let's go to your question. Let's see if there anything uh, along the lines of politics. Um, all right, I think this is relevant. It always stuns me how many light years ahead Ayn Rand was to all the other members of our species. <laughs> For 99% of our history, emotions win over logic and imagination wins over reality. Yes, and, and this is a great case of um, this is a great case of um, emotions winning over logic, emotions winning over reality, pretending, pretending, winning over what's real, imagination. And, but, but the essence of it all is not thinking, the negation of reason, the negation of rationality. That is, that is what is so bad about the human race. That's what's so harmful in the human race when we engage in that kind of behavior. And I think our current politics is an exemplar of that across the political spectrum. The entire political spectrum is like that. Uh, Michael says, what is the dialectic? Oh, God. What is the difference between Hegel and Marx's dialectic? I tried reading Hegel. It's unintelligible gibberish. How did this uh, charlatan become so influential off of long and coherent German sentences? Well, I mean, everybody wrote long and coherent German sentences. That's German philosophy. So, you know, he's not any more coherent than Kant or uh, any of the others. So, no, I, you know, uh, to, to, to really appreciate German philosophy, you have to slug through those long sentences and try to try your best to understand them and try to get into the spirit of what they're trying to express. Um, I'm not the right person to ask these kind of questions. I mean, the, the basic idea of the dialectic is you've got opposing forces. A force rises, an opposing force rises, and in the clash between the forces, something new emerges. And when that new emerges, it's opposition will emerge, will, will, will again counter it, and then something new emerges. And it's this clash, constant clash, and something coming out 
on the other side, which is uh, the dialectic. It's it's uh, it's how history, it's how you explain all of history. Uh, and uh, and it, it is a necessary and deterministic process within history. Uh, Marx has a particular dialectic that has to do with classes. By the way, Nikos, you know Nikos, uh, Greek, uh, Greek uh, uh, intellectual. Uh, Nikos is doing a course for Ayn Rand University on, um, uh, Nikos is doing a course at Ayn Rand University on Marx, Marxism, which I think would be fascinating because I think very few people understand Marxism. And it's great to have Nikos do it because Nikos was a Marxist. Uh, so he, he, there was a phase in his life where he took it completely seriously. And he studied Marx and he was very serious about it. And he really delved deeply into it. And now he's going to teach it from an objectivist perspective. So uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, really exciting. If you have an opportunity to audit the class or to take it or sign up for Ayn Rand University to do it, uh, I'd encourage you to do that. I, 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 if I have the time, I want to audit that class. I'm, I'm, looking, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, but Marx's dialectic has to do with classes. And Marx's, of course, dialectic ultimately leads to the victory of the proletarian and, and to this ultimate utopia uh, of the dictatorship of the proletarian that, that ultimately leads to. But he accepts that history is evolves or, 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 or is determined by this process of dialectic. And he says, but history has an end. He sees an end to history. And that is with the victory of the proletarian. The, the, the final victory of the proletarian is, is, in a sense, the end of history. Now, again, to get deeper into that and to a deep understanding of that, I, I highly encourage you to take uh, Nikos's class. Adam says, uh, Kamala Harris lost the woke wing of the Democrats for having been tough on crime, DA. But she is very good on four key issues, abortion, immigration, foreign gangsters, and freedom of new technology. Do you know something that I don't? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I disagree with you on, on most of that. I, I, I don't think she, she lost the woke, but she's always played up to them. Kamala Harris is interested in only one thing, and that is power. And that is a position of power, gaining a position of power. She says what she needs to say to get the woke vote when she thinks the woke vote is important, as she did in California. And then she governs in a way that she thinks will promote her, her um, uh, career further. But it's not because she believes in anything. It's because she believes that to, to hold statewide office in California, she had to be tough on crime. Um, she's good on abortion, but almost any Democrat is good on abortion. She's not particularly good on immigration. Uh, she, she's uh, she's uh, driven by immigration like everybody else uh, from an altruistic perspective. Uh, she's not talking about job-based immigration. Her, you know, she has not come out and uh, favor, for example, for the, uh, as a solution to the immigration crisis that we have right now, the asylum crisis, to allow them to work. She's very sensitive, I guess, to the unions and to the idea that immigrants take American jobs. Uh, she hasn't talked about the expansion of H-1Bs, the expansion of all other uh, uh, visa programs. So, you know, she, she is really not uh, particularly good at immigration. She's, again, a standard Democrat. The Republicans are against immigration. So right now we'll be for immigration. But, what, you know, what will she be as president? Nobody knows. Nobody knows because... She'll do whatever she thinks is expedient when she's president. She, she, she's not a woman of principle in any regard. She's good on foreign gangsters. I take it that you mean that about Russia. Maybe. I don't know. Why? Because she follows the Biden administration's line on Russia. That doesn't mean that's what she believes. It doesn't mean, that, it doesn't mean that's what she would do as president. Uh, she'll be under a whole other set of pressures. Uh, and, and it's hard to tell where she would fall. I just don't believe she actually uh, is, is solid in any of those. She's freedom of new technology, really? Is she pro, is she against the White House attempts to regulate artificial intelligence? No, she's not. Is she, um, is she against uh, the Biden administration's massive efforts to go after big tech? No, she's not. Is, is she opposing the Justice Department's massive antitrust lawsuit that started, by the way, today, opening arguments were made today, 
um, in in the Google in the Google antitrust case. Is she against that on principle? No, she's not. So no, I, I mean I don't know what Camilla Harris is about because she's a complete pragmatist and and a, and a power lusting pragmatist at that. Uh, I don't think she knows what principles are. And other than abortion, I don't trust her on anything. And if 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 it was about Democrats, and there are lots of Democrats better than Kamala Harris, who, who uh, you know, would exert better leadership, but also who actually, I, I might actually believe what they say. But Kamala has, has shown that she cannot believe in what she says. Uh, no one says, do you uh, think being called out by Twitter's community notes could be a first step back to honesty? I don't know for whom. I'm not sure what this means. And I'm not sure. Are the community notes that good? Are they, do they call back people on honestly? Are, are, are they straightforward? And do they, are they selective on what they call you out on? And, and they're not on other things? Do they... The, the community notes, are they calling out uh, vaccine uh, uh, anti-vaxxers? No, they're not. Uh, are, they, are they calling out Elon Musk on some of the stupid things he says about Russia? No, they're not. Um, so, you know, are the community notes biased? Are they only calling out things that fit the, 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 the agenda of the people who run Twitter now versus in the past? No, I, I don't see it. I still think, I still see uh, Twitter, uh, and generally the culture as being uh, tribal and, and, uh, and not interested in facts and not interested in reality and not, not interested in truth. I just don't see where a push for truth is. All right. Um, so unless I miss something, no one, maybe, maybe uh, you can elaborate. All right. Uh, we're way behind on the Super Chat. Just to remind everybody, you can use the Super Chat to ask questions and support the show, value for value. Uh, you, you get some value out of listening to this show, even when you disagree. You're here. That means uh, you're, you're expressing the value in your behavior. But you're not trading. You're not being a trader. To be a trader, you should support the show in some way. You can do that on a monthly basis uh, by uh, going to Patreon and supporting the show over there or subscribe store or you're on bookshow.com slash supporting using PayPal. Or you can do it here. If you're on live, it's, it's the easiest way is to just do it here. Although I prefer you do it on Patreon or, or, or PayPal. Uh, just by pressing the Super Chat button and uh, doing a sticker uh, to show your support or by asking a question, even better, because that way you get to somewhat uh, uh, steer, uh, steer the show. Uh, Hopper Campbell asks, what makes Nikki Haley better than Vivek? Seems like most objectivists prefer her. It's a good question. I mean, here's the thing with Vivek. When Vivek is good, he's really, really, really good. And the more Vivek emphasizes the things that he's good on, the less he can win, the less chance he has on winning. For example, I saw today where he said, you know, he was talking about dismantling regulatory agencies, firing 75 percent of, um, uh, you know, 75 percent of, um, what do you call it, of government employees, of really shrinking government dramatically. And, and he says that sometimes. And when he's, when he's saying that, when he's talking about that, that's when he's likely to lose. Because that's not what people are really interested in. But there really is, he has a, um, a radical streak about him when it comes particularly to government and economic policy that I like, that, that I think that if came in maybe a different package, I think would really, really be good and really, really be good for the country and really, really, be, really, really be good to put out there and, and to talk about and discuss. 
He's terrible on social issues. Uh, you know, uh, wants to use government to impose certain of his social agenda, certainly terrible on abortion. He's terrible on Trump, that he won't say any negative thing about Trump. But he's terrible on foreign policy. Very, very bad on foreign policy. Uh, so uh, Nikki Haley, and, and he's flaky. And he gives off the vibes of he's slick. And he's, he's just a little too slick. And it's a little circusy. And it, it worries me because that slickness and that circus attitude, it, it, you know, it has the potential to alienate people from the parts of his message that are really good, that I completely agree with, that I would love to be able to support. I mean, it seems like if you're going to have great ideas in economics, you're either like super boring and dull and too laid back and uh, like Rand Paul was in the 2016 presidential campaign, or you're slick and, and I don't know, come across as sleazy like, like Vivek, right? What did Vivek have to attack everybody at the debates for? Why would, except Trump. Like if Vivek attacked Trump, I'd respect him. I could support him because despite the fact that I disagree with him on some things, I agree with him a lot on some things. And he says things that politicians don't say, that are typically not said. So I give him credit for that. But there's certain things that he does that, you know, have the Trump feel to them that uh, that it, they, they, they give up a dishonest vibe, they give up a manipulative vibe. I just don't trust the guy or like the guy. And that's Nikki Haley's strength. Uh, I don't think, I, you know, like every politician, I don't think Nikki Haley's necessarily honest. But Nikki Haley has written for years consistently about her defense of capitalism. She doesn't understand what capitalism is. She's not a consistent defender. But she's broadly on the side of freedom and liberty. Um, Haley is uh, good on foreign policy. She's excellent on foreign policy. Best candidate out there in foreign policy. Much tougher than Trump on every foreign policy issue. Much, Trump, uh, much tougher than DeSantis or Vivek or any of these guys. And she knows her stuff. She's actually been a governor and been a successful governor. She's articulate. She's smart. Uh, she, I disagree with her on things like abortion. But even on abortion, she had the courage during the debate to say, I don't think there should be one size fit all for all the states. I, I do think that there should be, there can be disagreement about this. I give her a lot of credit for that. I give her a lot of credit for the fact that she said that government spending is not just a Democrat's fault. It's also a Republican's fault. So I think she's a straight shooter. I think she's smart. I think she's likable. Um, I think she's electable. She beats all the other candidates in terms of a face-to-face -face of Biden, in terms of beating Biden. Uh, and I think um, she's not as... Um, radical as Vivek, but that makes her electable. Vivek can't get elected, but she can. Now, somebody said Vivek is running for VP. There's no way Vivek is going to be VP. I've said this over and over again. Vivek will not be Trump's VP. Trump will never choose as a VP somebody who has more energy than he does, somebody who's more radical than he is. Somebody who's younger and, and more charismatic in many respects than he is. He chose Pence, boring Pence, for a reason. Now, he might choose Nikki Haley. I think there's a good chance that Trump chooses Nikki Haley. Why? Because of her strengths and because she knows that she will, she will take the backstage. Now, whether she accepts, I don't know. But I think it would be a big mistake for her to accept. But I think she is the most likely VP candidate. 
I do not think he picks Vivek. Vivek is just too out there. Too, uh, uh, you know, too much of a gunslinger. Trump is enough of a gunslinger. He doesn't need another one as, as his number two. Ken asks, what about illegal immigrants problem in New York City? I talked about that earlier in the show. That's it, easy to solve. Just let them work. Give them work, give them work permits, and they, it takes care of itself. They, they, they make a living for themselves. They, you don't have to support them. And they leave New York City because New York City is too expensive for them to live in and work in. So they leave, but now they have money because they can work. Ugh. Candace Owen for VP. I can't think of a more disgusting idea. Um, Liam says, one of the saddest lessons in history is if we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. Yes. But that's a mentality. That's a mentality um, uh, of evasion. It's a mentality that gives up. It's a mentality of not thinking. That, that's, the, that's, the, that's shutting down your mind. But, you know, the, 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 the alternative approach is you've been boozled long enough, you, you stop paying attention to bed boozling and you live your life. All right. Oh, Jennifer says to call Sagan, quote. Yep. It makes sense. How are we doing on the poll? Yeah, we've got a 62% uh, on, on Haley, 19% of Vivek, 13% on DeSantis, 7% Trump. So we're still holding on to, there's still a significant number of people, like six people right now who voted for Trump, who'd vote for Trump, who, who are watching. Still a lot of people haven't voted. I think there are more people who haven't voted. So. Uh, if you're listening live now, you can go to chat and vote. Who would you vote for in the primary if it was held tomorrow uh, of these four candidates? I only had, only had room for four people, so I only put up four candidates. Um, who would you vote um, if you had uh, that choice? Um, all right, still got a, a bunch of questions, but way behind on the, uh, on the uh, Super Chat. So if you want to support the show, if you don't have a question, you can do like Wes just did, 50 bucks. Uh, with a sticker, just just to show support, uh, value for value. Kath, thank you, Catherine, uh, twice. Catherine, twice, thank you. Uh, let's see who else did stickers. That's all. That's the furthest back I can go. So thank you, uh, guys, uh, for the uh, for the support. All right, that doodle bunny, that doodle bunny. I, I don't resent the world. I resent the dishonest, nihilistic cretins I am forced to associate with in this world. Is there an out of the, for this? I don't think so. Well, the out is take control of your own life. The out is take control of the people you deal with. The out is, you know, take control of uh, the people you associate with, the work that you do, the, 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 the friends that you have, the environment in which you live, the, yeah, take control of this stuff and associate as little as possible with the Cretans out there as you can. And, and, and try to associate with people you choose to associate, people you like to associate with as much as you can in your life. Uh, so, you know, living life resenting the people around you is not fun. And, and it's just gonna make you embittered and angry and un unhappy don't do it. Find good people. Surround yourself with good people. Find a beautiful place to live. You know, whatever means you have, make that place beautiful. Make it meaningful to you. And, and live. And you don't have to get rich to do that. You can do that at any income level. But you have to make choices. And you have to be courageous. And you have to take risks. And you have to be willing to change, to change your life. Mary Eileen, thank you. Really appreciate the support. Ken says we met in Columbia at NYU. Yeah, I don't remember you, but that's okay. I meet thousands of people 
I interact with thousands of people a year. I, I, I don't remember 99.9% .9 of them. That's just the way I'm built. Some people, like Bill Clinton, remember everybody they've ever shaken hands with. They remember them. They remember their name. They're, I don't remember anything. I don't remember people's faces. I don't remember their names. Um, it's not what I do, right? Why I could never be in politics, I guess. But um, I interact with a lot of people. Michael says, I don't believe anyone really wants to move to red states. It's just typically desirable blue states have become unbearable and unaffordable. Well, I don't know what that means, right? I don't know what that means. Why don't people want to move to red states? Because they're red, but if, 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 they're, if, if, they're, if they're cheap and they're, if, if the blue states are so bad, then people do want to move to red states because they're relatively better. Um, and I, I don't think people do want to move to red states. I mean, people have different values than you do. People have lots of different values. I, you know, you should see the number of comments. Every time I say something about San Francisco being a, a beautiful place, I got this comment about my San Francisco comment like, no, you know, who the hell would want to live in San Francisco? I'd much rather live in Des Moines, Iowa. I mean, that to me is bizarre. But some people want to live in Des Moines, Iowa. That's why a lot of people live in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, but I wouldn't. You couldn't pay me to move to Des Moines, Iowa. I'm not interested in living in, 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 in the Midwest or the South. It's just, it, you know, I wouldn't want to live in Florida. There are a lot of places I wouldn't want to live. I, I would have loved, and it won't happen in my life, but I would have loved to have lived for a period in New York. That would have been exciting and a lot of fun. I'm, I'm glad I've spent a lot of time in New York, so I've enjoyed it. But I would have loved to have lived a couple of years when I had money and young enough to enjoy it in New York. I, it's never going to happen. I'm not going to go there. Um, I enjoyed living in Austin, Texas, red state. But I, I think the best combination is a blue city and a red state. That's the best combination. Austin is a good example. Um, I loved living in California. I would go back to California in a heartbeat, if not for the taxes. Even if it's a, I don't have, I don't have kids who have to go through the educational system there, but I would live there. Um, would I live in uh, anywhere else in Texas? Probably not. I don't like Florida. I don't. I, I wouldn't live in the South. Most places in the South. Maybe there's some places in around Chapel Hill, in again a blue area in a red state in North Carolina. Uh, but the reality is, and, and you look at maps of the United States, life expectancy is higher in blue states. Crime is lower in blue states. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, it's, it's not, you know, it's not what you would expect. Look at obesity levels. Where's their more obesity? Red states or blue states? Right. I don't think I'd live in Charlotte. Uh, but, but Chapel Hill, maybe. Um, there's no way in the Midwest that I'd want to live. You know, maybe Denver. I like Denver. I like Boulder. I like Seattle. I like I like Portland. I never live in Portland because Portland's crazy now, but I I, I would have liked to have. Um, but New York would be exciting. It would be fun. It's 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 interesting. It's fun. It's vibrant. It's dynamic. It's exciting. There's something new going on every single day. So, um, yeah, no, West Virginia, no. I've been to West Virginia. I've been to every state except North Dakota and Alaska, but uh, very few places I'd want to live. But most of them are too cold, um, and some of them are too hot, too humid, although now I live in a humid place, so maybe I'm used to it, and I don't, won't mind it in the future. Yeah, uh, Joe says, Portland has both obesity and homelessness. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't go to Portland today. And uh, yeah, the homeless issue is a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal. It's a real, um, it's a real uh, 
deterrent to quality quality of life. Hawaii, super expensive to live well in Hawaii is very expensive, very expensive. What are you talking about? New York City has some of the lowest crime rates in the country. There's no civil unrest in New York. There's, they've got a problem with the migrants right now. The solution is easy. If, if Biden would just listen to the mayor of New York, he'd have it solved. Just let them work. But um, you've got way too many homeless people in New York. Uh, but, yeah, no, I, I, New York is nowhere near as bad as people think it is. Yeah, I mean, New York is not a place for, for little kids. I wouldn't want to raise kids in New York. Wouldn't want to raise kids in New York. San Diego. San Diego is probably my favorite place anyway. If, if I was going to move somewhere, and again, if you could abstract away California taxes, then I would move to San Diego. It, it's got perfect weather, pretty much, except for June gloom, where, where it gets cloudy in June. Um, but other than that, as perfect weather, it's beautiful. It's just gorgeous. And people are nice and friendly. I suspect downtown might have um, a, a homeless problem. So I'm going to reserve judgment until I go there and see if there's a homeless problem. I, I fell in love with La Jolla the first time I saw it. But yeah, it's super expensive. Why is it super expensive? Because lots of people want to move there and they don't build enough because of zoning. All right, let's see. Uh, Lewis. By the way, we're only about halfway to the goal, so if anybody wants to help out, go for it. If objectivism has no contradictions, there is no room for other philosophies about human nature. What are the odds Ayn Rand was the only person to, to really get it, and since only a handful of people got her, really? I, I think the odds are, in my judgment, really, really, really high. <laughs> I mean... What are the odds that 100,000 years of human existence, Aristotle was the first guy to, to get that A is A. I mean, and he invented the rule, laws of logic, and nobody, nobody got the laws of logic before that. And given that human history since Aristotle has been dominated by Christianity, it's not surprising at all that we didn't get a rational philosophy or rational ethics out of that age, because... Christianity is a super irrational. Super irrational. So, you know, I mean, Papa did not have a rational ethic. He didn't develop an ethics of rational self interest. And maybe it's implied, maybe it's suggested, but it's not a developed theory of his that is integrated into, a philosoph into his philosophical. Views. So let's get, I mean, you might like Papa, but, y y you know, what he did and what he didn't do, is it it's important. Um, Ayn Rand got not just human nature, and I think she got it, uh, but she got also what morality is, what morality requires, and that's massive, and that nobody else got. People... You know, people rejected altruism, but they either went, like some in the, in the 19th century, they went, whoosh, uh, in, in, in the direction of subjectivism, because they rejected altruism, so they became hedonists in a sense. You've got some 19th century thinkers who are kind of egoistic in that sense, but it's not real egoism. And then you got a Nietzsche who rejects altruism, but it has nothing really to offer in its place except another form of subjectivism. Rand was the first and only philosopher in all of human history, you know, to connect reason with morality. Reason with morality. And to derive a, a, a moral code from man's nature and observations of reality. So objectively, which means consistent with logic and consistent with observation. And that's a massive achievement, but she achieved it. What are the odds that Einstein 
was the first person to come up with relativity. And how many people in the world today understand relativity? My physics professor in college at an engineering school claimed that there were just a handful of people in the entire world that really understood the theory of relativity. So, you, Rand, somebody has to get it right the first time. Somebody has to make the observation. Somebody has to figure it out. It could have been anybody, but it turned out it was Rand. Now, it couldn't have been anybody, but, you know. I mean, there were there been a lot of philosophers, but they all were too inspired by religion or too inspired by Plato. Rand really is the first one to take Aristotle seriously, to take his virtues, to take what's right about him, and then develop it, take it to, 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 to you know, and, and, and then have the insight, the genius, to take the 2,000 years of knowledge that come after Aristotle and integrate that with his fundamental ideas into something new. And that's what she does. And she's a unique, once a millennium type genius to be able to do that. So what are the odds? One, one genius in a millennium. Those are the odds. James says, the Daily Wire is really going after radical individualism and selfishness lately. They just posted a video titled, A Life of Selfishness Leads to Misery. Could you do a response video to it? Yes. I, I, I haven't seen that one. Who, who, is, who does it? I mean, is it... Uh, I'm curious if, uh, to what extent Ben Shapiro is involved in the anti-radical individualism part of what they're doing. I, I, I mean, I'm not saying that I'd be surprised if he was involved, but I'm just curious to what extent. On the other hand, the Daily Wire has bought the rights to make Atlas Shrugged into a TV series. So, I mean, it's just, it's just stunning, isn't it, that they can hold that kind of contradiction. They can love Atlas Shrugged, supposedly, and yet make a video about uh, a life of selfishness leads to misery. Scary. Scary. Uh, Tana says, Yohan, how do you know what to look for in a political candidate? What should somebody who is new to voting look for when mainstream politics and media seem so convoluted and corrupt? I mean, the first thing you want to look for is somebody who has a basic respect, I think, a basic respect for the American system of government. Somebody who respects separation of powers, respects the role of the Supreme Court, respects the difference between legislate, you know, uh, 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 somebody who respects the, 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 the American government is set up in some vague notion to, to protect freedom. You know, again, if I have to go to my opposition to Trump, Maybe the core of my opposition to Trump is that he has no clue about any of that. He doesn't care about any of it. He has no concept of separation of powers. He has no concept of the American system of government or that the idea of government is the preservation of freedom. He's, he's a, he's a, he, he'd love to be an authoritarian. He's just too weak to make it happen. He, he envies Putin and Xi for their ability to be authoritarians. So first, somebody who respects that and understands at least has a vague idea that the purpose of the American government is the preservation of freedom in some vague notion. Even if we don't agree on the definition of freedom, what freedom means, I get that. But a respect for the system of government that we have, because otherwise they will do everything to undermine it and undercut it and demean it and diminish it and then what do you have? Once the American system of government goes, then we're just open to authority. The only thing protecting us from authoritarianism today is separation of powers, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and a constitution. But once those are diminished, 
Once you have a president like Trump who doesn't care about those, who's willing to overturn an election, who's willing to, to, to do something that's clearly anti-constitutional and something simple and basic like an election, it's all over. Um, so that's one thing you look for. And then you look for, are they generally on the, on the, on the axis of, of pro-liberty, pro-freedom? Are they generally on the axis of pro-individual rights? Again, not that they're consistent, because none of them will be, and none of them are. But do they have some respect for free markets and the individual's right to choose his own path in life? This is why abortion is such a big issue. Because once you're anti-abortion, you're anti-life. You're anti you're anti the living. And so, you know, uh, an anti-abortion position is very hard to overcome for me, right? But uh, Stephen Harper, uh, Stephen says, um, Alma Deutsch will give a piano recital on December 14th in Vienna at Urba Schall. Um, she will compose new music, especially for the concert. Wow, that's exciting and fun. Hopefully it'll be recorded. I'm sure it will be. These days everything is recorded, so we'll be able to catch it, uh, catch the concert later on. Um, that that would be uh, that would be cool. Yeah, unfortunately the poll is gone. So once once that stream ended, the poll ended. Uh, you know, I could add the poll back in now, but but what would be the point? All right, thank you, Stephen, for letting us know. Uh, Michael says Kamala Harris also seems to think gibberish is a recognizable language. What happens if Biden passes, and that bimbo is writing the show? I, I don't think much changes. Advisors are the same. I mean, it's not like you're not like she is less here than uh, Biden is. I mean, Biden's already not here. Uh, Harper Campbell, does America have no culture outside of New York City? Most Americans are, bl uh, uh, Americans are bland, uncultured. New Yorkers have personality, strong opinions, appreciation for art and intellectual pursuits. Well, certainly, I think um, California has a culture. Uh, and, uh, you know, various parts of California... I think the cities have culture. Chicago has a culture. It has a great opera house. It has a great symphony orchestra. It has be beautiful architecture. Uh, people's personalities are a little different. So I think there are regional cultures in America. I wouldn't put down America that much. You know, Texas has a culture, if you want to call it that. Um, but, you know, primarily focused on barbecue. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't put down the rest of America that fast. But, uh, and even parts of Texas, Fort Worth has a great museum and, and uh, actually the, I think the largest collection of Bougaros, uh, one of my favorite artists from the 19th century is, uh, is, is owned by a businessman in, uh, in Fort Worth, Texas of all places. So there you go. You never know where you're gonna find uh, these, some of these great masterpieces. Um, Paulo Zeus, effect, effectiveness of free ports in the UK. You know, I don't really know. Um, my guess is anytime you establish an area where there's relatively less regulations, less control, less taxes, they're going to do well, relatively speaking. But um, yeah, I, I don't know specifically about the UK. Uh, Ryan says, don't evade your Super Chat support. Yes. We're still only halfway, guys. Somebody out there. Help us out. Help us reach the goal. Although, you know, we lost uh, two-thirds of the people watching earlier. So uh, it's going to be impossible to, to make our numbers tonight. Uh, what does anyone have to lose by being honest? Or do politicians not even know how anymore? Sad and scary. Well, I think some politicians don't know how to be honest. They, they have no concept of being honest. I think some people, a lot of people, and this is where evasion comes in, don't know how to be honest. They've, they've, they've given up on reality. They've given up on their mind. So it's gone. It's honesty has no standing, has no footing. Um, 
But what do you have to lose with honesty? Votes? Uh, emotional? You know, people will be mad at you. People will be upset at you. People won't like you. Lots of different things people think they have to lose. And, but they don't realize the, the great value of being honest, the, the, the upside of being honest, and, and the, the, the life-affirming ness of being honest. The fact that it is, you, you know, it's, it's how to live. And once you're dishonest in one place, you're going to be dishonest elsewhere. You're going to undermine your life systematically. Spy man. Whoops, what did I do to spy man? Spy man. Um, I think Americans have lost their confidence when it comes to foreign policy. We still have the capability to be strong, a strong force in the world. But the poor execution of Iraq really did a number on us. Well, I mean, it's, it, it goes back far further back than Iraq. Iraq was a consequence of our weakness already. We were already weak. That's why Iraq happened. That's why we did Iraq so pathetically. I mean, you have to go back to at least Vietnam, maybe even Korea, uh, to see American weakness and America lack of strength and lack of confidence. Uh, the last war we won was World War II. That's a long, long time ago. Uh, and, and altruism has seeped into every aspect of American foreign policy. And you got a series of presidents from Eisenhower to Kennedy to Johnson to Nixon to all of them pragmatists, deal makers, losers, not willing to, you know, not willing to stand up for what American interests really are, guiding us into wars that we shouldn't be in, not letting us win when we get into them, running from conflict with our tails between our legs, engaging in detente and compromise and negotiation with evil regimes all over the world. It's way before Iraq. Now, 9-11 did do something, and I, I meant to mention this during the segment earlier. 9-11 was such an evasion. The fact that our politicians would not name the enemy, the fact that our politicians would not name Islam in any form, in any way, was such an evasion that I think it set the tone for the last 20-some years. That evasion maybe is the biggest of all. When American lives were at stake, when American lives were, were, were being lost, and then the evasion was, was Iraq and the evasion was Afghanistan. And 20 years of war in Afghanistan. All the generals knew that the way we were doing it, we couldn't win. All the generals knew that what we were doing was useless and pathetic. And our politicians knew it. And yet, they never told the American people. They lied to us so thoroughly. And all of them, all the way through Trump. So, it was, um, it, it, it was more than, it, it, it was Iraq. Iraq was the kind of the culmination of the evasion. And um, it, it was a manifestation of the evasion, but the original evasion, the real evil evasion, the one that set everything in motion, if you will, was, was the despic our despicable behavior after 9-11, not naming the enemy and not going after the enemy aggressively. Spyman has a follow-up here. On Iraq, I think that could have been a renewal because of 9-11, but it never felt like we got justice. Absolutely. Because Iraq wasn't the place to get justice. Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. Iraq was, was a diversion. You know, naming the enemy. If you'd named the enemy, then you'd know that the enemy was Saudi Arabia and Iran. It was Islamism. And you would have gone after the Islamists. And you'd known that occupying Afghanistan and bringing them democracy wasn't the way to go. Destroying the infrastructure of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda there was the way to go. And making it clear that you would continue to destroy it every time they came back. And you drop as big of a bombs as necessary to never make it possible. But why put troops on the ground? And if you put troops on the ground, why not put them on the ground where it counted, like Tora Bora caves to get bin Laden? I mean, everything about the post-9-11 war was a, 
uh, it, the post 9 11 reaction was a disaster. And it all starts from that initial evasion of not being willing to name the enemy. There was one week in which Bush called them Islamo fascists, and then he stopped. And that week was late, right? It wasn't right after. So yes, we had an opportunity for a reset, and we completely failed. And that's because the American sense of life was not there. American confidence was not there. Uh, American self-esteem was not there. And most importantly, we were dominated by, and, and the reason for all these things not being there is the dominance of altruism in our lives. Lewis asks, what distinction is there to the U.S. failing in Afghanistan and Russia also failing in Ukraine? Oh, th th there is a big difference. Um, Russia's failing in a conventional war. Army versus army. Tank versus tank. Uh, Russia is throwing everything it has in terms of its conventional army uh, at the problem and it is still failing. The United States failed, not army towards army, there was no army. It failed against a, um, a um, uh, what do you call it, unconventional uh, a guerrilla terrorist tactics. It, it failed, it's much more similar to the way the Soviet Union failed in Afghanistan. Asymmetric warfare, which it should never have gotten involved in. But it wasn't a lack of technology. It wasn't a lack of firepower. Plus, uh, the United States um, never really deployed substantial military force in Afghanistan. It was always a minority of our troops, small minority of our troops, a fraction of the American army. But the other thing was, Putin actually wants to win. Putin went in and was going to go for Kiev. America never wanted to win. Wanted to somehow pretend that it was liberating the Afghans as if the Afghans want liberty. And it was just going to give them the liberty. And was just going to, just going to, uh, uh, you, you know, all it had to do was show up and the Afghans would embrace Americans and embrace democracy and, and liberate everything. And it's just a, a, a complete misunderstanding, or well, misunderstanding, complete evasion of the nature of the place. And then to keep American troops there for 20-something years under those conditions, knowing you're not winning, knowing they're just dying, and knowing they're dying for nothing, because nothing will change in Afghanistan, is just such a crime. Just, ugh. And the kids who died there for nothing, died for nothing. Putin wants to win. Putin's put his entire military force, conventional military force, to face off against the Ukrainians. Now, you know, what, what we needed to do in Afghanistan is destroy the Taliban, destroy Al-Qaeda, hunt them down, and then leave promising that every time they came back, we would bomb them to oblivion. And not worry about democracy, women's rights, all, all the wonderful things, because they were never sustainable. It was never real. It was always a fantasy. And, and to really establish those things in Afghanistan, we would have had to stay there for several generations. And we are, that's not the job of the American military. You know, we spend so much time, money, resources, on a on, on military being a peacekeeper and a builder of nations. What a frigging waste. The military's only job is to destroy the enemy, to win wars, and only to fight them when they're necessary. It's not to build democracies. Leiren uh, says, thank you for your long shows and news shows. Very interesting topic tonight. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the support. All right, we're chipping away at our goal. Really appreciate it. Slowly but steadily, we're getting there. So, you know, keep at it. We might actually make it. You know, we might not, but we might actually make it. Still got quite a few questions here. 
So we'll keep going as long as you ask questions and you put dollars behind them. It seems to me that people vote against particular candidates rather than vote th for them. What are your thoughts? Yes, I, I think we, we, because our candidates are so bad, generally, because it's hard to admire anybody, I think many of us vote primarily against the candidate we think is, is worse. We vote for the less of two evils rather for somebody we like. But I don't think that's what most Americans do. Uh, I, I think there's a significant number of Americans who like Trump. They pretend not to like him, but 50 plus percent of Republicans say they're going to vote for Trump in their primaries. That's a majority of Republicans. That's a lot of people. Uh, there were, I think, people who liked Biden. Maybe now then no, nobody likes Biden. Um, but yes, the, the, the mo I agree with you. A majority votes against the candidate they, they dislike. Uh, but there are people who like, I think a lot of people liked Obama. I think a lot of people liked Clinton. I think a lot of people liked Bush. I don't understand why, but they did. So some people vote for people they like. I, I, I'm jealous of them because I wish there was a candidate I liked that I could vote for. I've never voted for anybody I liked. Even when I voted, I, I, I always voted for people I disliked, but who I thought were the least worst. Frank says, for me, Trump's presidency began on the, uh, to end the day after Charlottesville Nazi rally. Later, he sided with Putin in Helsinki, then COVID plus January 6th, right? Uh, no, I mean, uh, you know, Trump's Trump was bad from day one. I disliked him from day one. Um, you know, as soon as in the press conference, right after inauguration, he had pictures, uh, satellite photos of the crowd and started arguing with reporters about whether he had a record crowd or didn't have a record crowd. I knew this guy was a complete flake loser idiot. I mean, I knew that well before, but his presidency was going to be a complete disaster. As soon as he nominated, uh, what's his name? Um, the guy who just indicted for... Uh, 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 you know, as soon as he had Bannon there and he had the trade guy, whose name I forget from UC Irvine, as his advisor on trade, I knew that his president was a loss. But I do agree with you. Charlottesville was a, a real eye-opener because, I mean, he was so horrible on the Charlottesville thing. Uh, Peter Navarro, thank you, Frank, Peter Navarro. He was so horrible in Charlottesville. But what was interesting about Charlottesville was not how horrible he was. That was really bad, and that was disgraceful for President of the United States to take the kind of position that he took. But the spin on it, the, the, 40, the, the, the people who justified it, the, ported, the people who pretended he didn't say what he said, to this day, I have people who say, oh, no, you're wrong. He never said that. Oh, yes, he did. I have a transcript. I have video. I know exactly what he said. The people who ignore is actually words in order to justify him. That was the shocker to me on, on, after Charlottesville. Charlottesville was so despicable. Should have been condemned outright to such an extent. And what he did, the moral equivalency, the... You know, the, 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 as close as he could come to, to justifying these Nazis. That was just horrific. And that people were horrified by that. That blew me away. That just blew me away. But then, yeah, but that was bad. Tariffs were bad. His, his whole attitude towards trade, everything he said about trade was so ignorant. You know, no other president, in modern times at least, comes close in terms of the ignorance of those statements. Uh, his attitude towards uh, the brutal dictator of North Korea, the fact that he, the love letters, the groveling, the, the meetings, the, the flowers or whatever, he, he literally picked up a communist flag and waved it at one of the, in, in, in one of the meetings with him that somebody in the crowd had. Just a, a, oh, yeah, and then, of course, it's Putin and, and all of that. But, yeah, I, I was reeling against Trump all of 2016. So 
it, none of it surprised me, but it still shocked me and it still disappointed me. All right, Hugh. Thank you, Hugh. Is there an objectivist ranking of U.S. presidents? How might that be produced? Who would be the top five? I mean, it's much more difficult to do a top five than a bottom five. I can easily do a bottom five. A top five, I mean, I would have to say Washington. I mean, just, just primarily because he left when he did, when he, had, when he had opportunity to be president for life, basically, and he decided to leave and, and kind of reaffirming this completely new experiment in, in governance that the American Republic was. So Washington. Uh, um, Grover Cleveland is one of the great presidents, um, if you read about him. Uh, I think a lot of the founders w w were decent presidents. Uh, you, you know, uh, Jefferson, Adams has a problem because of the, the, the Alien and Sedition Act, but Quincy Adams, I think, was pretty good. Um, uh, so some of those 19th century, I mean, Lincoln, obviously. I wouldn't put Reagan in the top five. No way. No way. Reagan destroyed the Republican Party and, and has a legacy. His legacy is very negative. But, but you know, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, um, Coolidge would be higher than Reagan. Coolidge would be higher than Reagan. I, I don't know. So Coolidge would, would, was the best 20th century president, probably. Calvin Coolidge. Probably best 20th century. But in terms of 19th century, Cleveland and the founders, Quincy Adams maybe, and Lincoln, of course. Lincoln was a giant w with all his problems. And he had problems and he did things that were wrong, but he was a giant. They were not good people on both sides. I don't care. Uh, you know, this, this, uh, I'll, I'll deviate from the thing. There were no good people on both sides. You don't stand in a rally where people are yelling, Jews will not replace us, and you're a good person. Uh, only a good person at a rally like that would leave. As soon as the neo Nazis showed up, they would leave. There were no good people at a neo Nazi rally. None. Zero. Zilch. No, you might know people who are not racist, but these are people who tolerate racists. These are people who support racists. These are people who are willing to march with racists. These are people who are willing to be supportive of racists. And they should be condemned, every single one of them. I don't care if they went to their rally with good intentions because they didn't like the toppling of the statue. But even opposing the toppling of a statue of Robert E. Lee, a racist who sacrificed the lives of hundreds of thousands of young men for his racist ideology. There are no good people defending the Confederacy. There are no good people marching with neo-Nazis. There are no good people at a rally where they're yelling, Jews will not replace us. Blood and soil. They're not good people. If you hear that and you're at a rally, you leave. You don't stick around. By sticking around, you show support. By showing support, you become an accessory to their evil. There are no good people on that side of the fence in Charlottesville. Zero, zilch, none. I don't care if they're your friends, I don't care if they're your, your family. By being there, they were not good. They were bad people. Maybe in the rest of their lives, they're wonderful. But on that day, in that place, they were accessories to evil. And they should pay the price for that. And the price is simple, to be condemned as such.
All right. People did not leave. There was not mass leaving. People stayed there. And the president, when he commented on the event, did not have to relate to the people who were leaving. That wasn't what he was talking about. The question was the people who stayed, the people who marched, the people who were part of that protest. And that should have been condemned as an outright, unequivocal, unquestionable evil. There's no two, there are no good people on both sides here. There's only the side of evil and everybody that opposes evil. And the people who walked away were the people who opposes evil. And indeed, even the cops, you know, people died. The, 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 the cops in the helicopter who died, they, they should have never been there. There should have never been such an event. And nobody, nobody, the president didn't care. People didn't stick around in the protest because they were constrained by the cops from leaving. God. I mean, the excuses and the rationalizations. And again, the president shouldn't have been concerned with that. You don't, as a president, say that the good people on both sides, when one side are neo-Nazis and the people who support them, and maybe at the margins of people trying to leave. But then the people trying to leave wouldn't think that they're part of the problem. Spyman says, do you not see an equivalence with Antifa? They were a large part of the violence at Charlottesville, too. They weren't the night before. They weren't what was, talk what, what was being discussed. They were part of the violence later, but they were not there. And, and the, the, the assembly, the, the demonstration, the whole purpose of it was organized and created by the neo-Nazis. The way you condemn it completely, you condemn it to hell, and then you can then say there are also people on the other side uh, associated with the violence, Antifa, and they're evil too. But the good people on both sides, good people on both sides, really? You have to treat as the primary the people who initiate the activity. And the people who initiated Charlottesville were the crazies on the right, not the crazies on the left. You can condemn Antifa for, for, for burning Portland. There's plenty of opportunities to go after the evil that is Antifa. In Charlottesville, Charlottesville was about the neo-Nazis and the, and the white supremacists and, and the Confederacy lovers on the right. And they needed to be called out and they needed to be identified as evil and, 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 and called out as evil. And the fact that that was not done is a stain on this country and a stain on the presidency and another good reason never to vote for Donald Trump. And the fact that Antifa was there as well does not justify not calling them out. Spyman asked, do you have any intention to come to Detroit to give any talks? I'd love to see you live. I'm giving a talk in Michigan at a high school, but I don't think it's a public talk, so I don't think it'll be open to the public in November. So right now, I have no plans for a public talk in Michigan. There was some talk about students, maybe Jennifer knows if she's here. I don't know if she's here. Uh, students for Liberty at University of Michigan inviting me to come and speak. I actually ask about that. But, uh, but uh, if they invite me to speak, that'll be a, a, a public talk. It'll be out in Ann Arbor, not in Detroit, uh, but you could come to that. So if we can, if we can do a, a uh, if we can do this talk at University of Michigan at Students for Liberty, if we can make that happen, um, and, and it, it, it's going to get tricky because we're uh, running out of days to do this, but hopefully we can pull it off, then... Um, then I will be there, what is it, the f second week in November? Sec second week, f first full week in November. Second week in November. So hopefully there will be a, a, a public talk that you can come to. Stephen Harper says, a show where you address comments on past shows would be fun. 
clarify misinterpretations and call out strawman arguments, promotes commenting, which helps the algorithm. That's true. Um, how do I address comments on past shows? Oh, you mean I, I pull up YouTube and I start addressing the comments on there? That could be fun. Uh, Apollo Zeus, evasion is a form of psychological suppression. No, evasion is primary to that, psychological suppression. Evasion is not thinking. It's, it's not engaging. It's not looking. It's not acknowledging reality. Psychological repression is, a, I think, a consequence of that. But again, probably outside my realm of expertise. All right, we're close to ending, about $200 short if somebody wants to push us over the, 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 the top. Uh, or if you want to ask a question, make it a $20 question at least. Um, Jared Polis is on track to end income tax in Colorado. Is he? I know he wants to, but is he actually going to do it? And is forcing cities to remove building regulations. He has also said he wants to bring in migrants to build. Is the future with better dams? I mean, I don't know enough about Jared, and I know my friends in Colorado are going to call me out if I say something wrong. But yeah, I've been impressed. I mean, he's talked about uh, he's talked about eliminating income tax in the state. He's talked about reducing regulations. He's talked about being pro-immigration. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, Jared Polis should run for president. I, I, I might vote for him as a Democrat. But, yeah, I mean, the future might be in, in Democrats like Polis. What, will Democrats vote for him? Because he seems far too radical for most Democrats. Moondog, you mentioned before that you would like to know what happened in the 10th, 11th century's al alchemy, the search for truth, coded in religious language. What? Um, I would like to know what happened in the 10th and 11th centuries. Uh, and, and you say alchemy, the search for truth, coded in religious language. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, during the 10th and 11th century, and then later on, there's a, 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 even Newton participated in this. There was a lot of searching um, for, um, uh, you know, codes in, in, in religious text. There was some element of trying to turn metals into gold. Uh, Newton participated in both practices. But this is pure mysticism. It had nothing to do with science. It isn't a precursor to science. It is, it is just a, 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 a different application to mysticism. It's a dedication, a different type of dedication to mysticism. Um, but it, it, you know, I don't view it at all as a, a precursor to science at all because it's looking in the wrong place. It's looking at the text. Science is looking at reality. Matdif, something not mentioned much in mainstream talking points is that Putin is in a position where his life could be on the line if he loses. How powerful an incentive? Um, us, state, NATO doesn't face that. That's true. Uh, Putin could lose his life if he loses, could lose his life anyway. Um, but... Um, You know, uh, uh, yeah, Putin is motivated, but it doesn't help much because he's not on the front line fighting. Uh, now, would he use nukes because he's actively motivated? But his life would end if he used nukes. One way or the other, his life is ending. Uh, so I, I don't think it changes much in terms of the outcome. All right, guys, um, it's late. I will see you all. Sorry about the, uh, the internet going out there and breaking the show up into two. It happened this morning as well, which is not good. But I will see you tomorrow morning. Well, actually, tomorrow, 3 p.m. Tomorrow, 3 p.m. East Coast time will be the news roundup. I had to move it because I've got a doctor's appointment in the morning. So 3 p.m. tomorrow. See you then. Bye, everybody.